Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. This presentation is one on a popular esoteric subject, one that has fascinated the minds of many explorers and dreamers for hundreds of years. Today we will be discussing Agartha, or Shambhala, Operation High Jump, the real reasons for it, and the Nazi involvement in the occult. With a dive on high jump, we must address some of the possible occultic reasons that the Nazis were so interested in Antarctica. This leads us to the lost mythological land known as Agartha. Agartha is a legendary kingdom that is said to be located in the Earth's core and it is related to the theory of hallow Earth. According to the ancient Greeks, there were caverns under the surface which were entrances leading to the underworld. In ancient times, the concept of a subterranean land inside the earth appeared in mythology, folklore, and legends. The idea of subterranean realms seemed arguable and became intertwined with the concept of places of origin or afterlife, such as the Greek underworld or the Nordic underworld, the Christian hell and the Jewish shell, with details describing inner earth and Kabbalistic literature such as the Zohar. The idea of a subterranean realm is also mentioned in Tibetan Buddhist belief. According to one story from Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there is an ancient city called Shambhala, which is located inside the earth, and we'll touch on that again shortly. According to the ancient Greeks, there were caverns under the surface which were entrances leading to the underworld. In Mesopotamian religion, there is a story of a man who, after traveling through the darkness of a tunnel in the mountain of Mashu, entered a subterranean garden. In Celtic mythology, there is a legend of a cave called Cruechan, also known as Ireland's Gate to Hell, a mythical and ancient cave from which, according to legend, strange creatures would emerge and be seen on the surface of the earth. There are also stories of medieval knights and saints who went on pilgrimages to a cave located in Station Island, County Donegal in Ireland, where they made journeys inside the earth into a place of purgatory. In County Down, Northern Ireland, Ireland there is a myth which says tunnels lead to the land of the subterranean Da'anan, a group of people who are believed to have introduced Druidism to Ireland and then went back underground. In Hindu mythology, the underworld is referred to as Patala. In the Bengali version of the Hindu epic Ramayana, it has been depicted how Rama and Lakshmana were taken by the king of the underworld, Aharavan, brother of the demon king Ravana, and later on they were rescued by Hanuman. The Angami Naga tribes of India claim that their ancestors emerged in ancient times from a subterranean land inside the earth. The Taino from Cuba believe their ancestors emerged in ancient times from two caves in a mountain underground. Natives of the Trobri and Islands believe that their ancestors had come from a subterranean land through a cavern hole called Obu Kula. Mexican folklore also tells of a cave in a mountain five miles south of Ojinaga, and that Mexico was possessed by devilish creatures who came from inside the earth. In the Middle Ages, an ancient German myth held that some mount mountains located between Eisenach and Gotha held a portal to the inner earth. A Russian legend says that Samoyeds, an ancient Siberian tribe, traveled to a cavern city to live inside the earth. The Italian writer Dante describes a hollow earth in his well-known 14th century work called Inferno in which the fall of Lucifer from heaven caused an enormous funnel to appear in a previously solid and spherical earth, as well as an enormous mountain opposite it, called Purgatory. In Native American mythology, it is said that the ancestors of the Mandan people in ancient times emerged from a subterranean land through a cave at the north side of the Missouri River. There is also a tale about a tunnel in the San Carlo Apache Indian Reservation in Arizona near Cedar Creek, which is said to lead inside the earth to a land inhabited by a mysterious tribe. It is also the belief of the tribes of the Iroquois that their ancient ancestors emerged from a subterranean world inside the earth. The elders of the Hopi or Hopi people believe that a Sipapu entrance in the Grand Canyon exists, which leads to the underworld. 
Brazilian Indians who live alongside the Parima River in Brazil claim that their forefathers emerged in ancient times from an underground land and that many of their ancestors still remain inside the earth. Ancestors of the Incas supposedly came from the caves which are located east of Cusco, Peru. Shakespeare even spoke about it. The following lines from Act 3, Scene 2 of Shakespeare's play, A Midsummer's Night Dream, written in London in 1595-96, suggest that the idea may have been known in Western Europe a hundred years before it took on a more scientific form. Hermia, I'll believe as soon this whole earth may be bored and that the moon may through the center creep and so displease her brother's noontide with antipodes. Now there isn't anything prophetic here folks. I know many of you truth seekers know full well about Shakespeare and the real origins of his plays. And let's briefly touch on that. Modern day historians believe that some of his works may have been partially written in tandem with others. But some scholars and even fellow writers are skeptical that Shakespeare wrote any of his celebrated sonnets or plays. And that Shakespeare was actually a pseudonym used to disguise the true identity of the real author. Sir Francis Bacon was one of the earliest alternatives put forward. Beginning in the mid-19th century, a graduate of Cambridge, Bacon was highly accomplished. He was one of the creators of the scientific method, was a well-regarded philosopher, and rose through the ranks of the Tudor court to become Lord Chancellor and a member of the Privy Chamber. And he is also said to have been Queen Elizabeth I's Elizabeth, Ill illegitimate son. They believe that Bacon provided clues behind for intrepid later scholars, concealing secret messages or ciphers about his identity as a kind of literary trail of breadcrumbs. Some have gone to even further extremes, arguing that Bacon's ciphers reveal a larger alternative history of the Tudor era. And that's as far as we can go into this one, but feel free to take in this information on your own as it is important and shows once again the deep deception that has been perpetrated upon us all for many centuries. 19th century French occultist Alexandre St. Ives published the first reliable account of the lost underground city of Agartha in Europe. According to him, the secret world of Agartha and all of its wisdom and wealth will be accessible for all mankind when Christianity lives up to the commandments which were once drafted by Moses and God. Meaning when the anarchy which exists in our world is replaced by the synergy. St. Ives gives a lively description of Agartha in his book as if it were a place which really exists, situated in the Himalayas in Tibet. St. Ives' version of the history of Agartha is based upon revealed information, meaning received by St. Ives himself through attunement. Now, attunement was the early term adopted by practitioners of energy medicine, originally developed by Lloyd Arthur Meeker and his colleagues. Meeker taught and practiced attunement as a central feature of his spiritual teaching and ministry. Emissaries of Divine Light, it was called. Attunement is taught as a personal spiritual practice and as a healing modality offered through the hands. Emissary, emissaries of divine light believe that attunement is a pivotal factor in the conscious evolution of humanity. According to authors and researchers Amadeo Giannani and Ray Palmer, Vice Admiral Byrd announced in February of 1947, just before venturing into a 2750 kilometer journey across the North Pole, said, I'd like to see the land beyond the pole. That area behind the pole is the center of the great enigma. According to some, it is believed that during Vice Admiral Byrd's flight over the North Pole that took place in 1947, he said via radio that beneath was not snow, but huge areas of land with mountains, forests, and vegetation, huge lakes and rivers with animals that resembled mammoths. Before his death, he had said there existed a land beyond the pole that was, quote, an enchanted continent in the sky, a permanent mystery of Earth. That land, according to other theories, was the legendary Rainbow City, home to a fabulous lost civilization. 
The possibility that the Earth is hollow and that it can be accessed through the North and South Poles and that secret civilizations flourish within it has spurred the imagination of people throughout centuries. Evidence of this we find in the history of countless ancient civilizations as mentioned earlier. The Babylonian hero Gilgamesh visited his ancestors in the bowels of the earth. In Greek mythology, Orpheus tries to rescue Eurydice from the underground hell. It was said that the pharaohs of Egypt communicated with the underworld, which could be accessed via secret tunnels hidden in the pyramids. And Buddhists believe and still believe that millions of people live in Agartha, an underground paradise ruled by the king of the world. So just when you think that these theories could be nothing more than excessive imaginations, you actually come across evidence in ancient history pointing towards the possibility of a world inside Earth. Countless stories, myths, and legends are told about underground cities and subterranean civilizations spread through a vast network of interconnected tunnels across the planet. There are many rumors surrounding these underground portals. We have only to remember the mysterious stories that revolve around the tunnels and galleries of the Cueva de los Tayos in Ecuador, or stories about the entrances to underground worlds supposedly located in the Andes, the Himalayas, the Gobi Desert, Turkey, and even below the Sphinx in Giza. The Hollow Earth Theory states that the Earth is a hollow planet with ancient entrances to the subterranean world scattered throughout it, including near both polar caps. This theory has been reported since ancient times, and scientists such as Edmund Haley have defended it throughout history. From 1880 to 1826, the American John C. Sims passionately reported the theory as well. According to him, there was a subterranean world inside our planet illuminated by a tiny sun, and that included mountains, forests, and lakes. Sims launched a national campaign aiming to raise the necessary funds to send an expedition to the Arctic to search for an entrance to the subterranean world. He even sent a proposal to the United States Congress with the intention of getting government assistance to find the entrance to the inner world. Unfortunately for him, he died before the government did allocate funding for his purpose and the expedition departed in 1838, although in truth its goals were not as altruistic. In reality, it was part of the ploy as world powers were trying to learn the importance of the only land not yet conquered, the Polar Caps. Regardless, commanded by Charles Wilkes, the expedition lasted four years. It served to discover the vast geographical extent of the Arctic, but no sign of a passage into the Earth was ever reported. The story was indeed fascinating, and thus Edgar Allan Poe, Jew. Jules Verne and H.P. Lovecraft, among many others, paid tribute to the fascinating story of the hollow earth in their writings, as many of you know. Edmund Haley, the English scientist from the 1600s, early 1700s, who studied the comet that bears his name, may have been the first to develop a scientific hypothesis about the hollow earth. After a series of observations of the Earth's magnetic field, Halley concluded that the anomalies observed could only be explained if the Earth was composed of two spheres, an external solid one and an internal hollow one, each with its own magnetic axis. Later on, another American, Cyrus Teed, became convinced that it is mathematically impossible to discern whether we are inside or outside of a sphere, so we could be living inside a hollow universe. In the center, it would be the sun, with the planets and stars only appearing bright to us because they reflect sunlight on the surface of the concave Earth. With the dawn of the 20th century, other scholars such as William Reed and Marshall Gardner also believed they could provide evidence of the existence of an inner world. One of the most curious facts wielded as an argument made by some Arctic explorers was that air and water temperatures warmed as they approached the North Pole. Based on these and other observations, they also claim that mammoths were not extinct but still inhabiting the interior of the earth. And this backs Admiral Byrd's claim that he did indeed witness animals that, quote, looked like mammoths. Interestingly, the hollow earth theory did not end there. In fact, in 20th century, with a knowledge of geography and geology of the earth that was still lacking, there were those who continued trying to access the 
mysterious world under the Earth's crust. For example, some of the Nazi leaders, the lovers of ancient myths and the occult in Germany, showed a marked interest in these type of theories. Yes, dear listeners, the Nazi leaders also believed in this, including Adolf Hitler. But for him, it provided the location where the pure and perfect Aryans, who he thought dominated the world, would meet. What is more, the German Thule or Thule Society, the main esoteric circle of the time, held a very close hypothesis, although theirs was related to the myths of lost underground kingdoms of Agartha and Shambhala. And understand, ladies and gentlemen, that the Thule Society was the prominent Illuminati establishment authority of this time. And understand, folks, that just like in the millennia of the past, or just like today, these mystery school groups possess many forms of knowledge that is still largely unknown by the masses. So it is feasible for this group to possibly be, have been correct in its theory. The first element of Nazi occult beliefs was in the mystic land of Hyperborea, Thule. Just as mystery, mystery school initiate Plato had cited the Egyptian legend of the sunken island of Atlantis, Herodotus mentioned the Egyptian legend of the continent of Hyperbo Hyperborea in the far north. When ice destroyed this ancient land, its people migrated south. Writing in 1679, the Swedish author Olaf Rudbeck identified the Atlanteans with the Hyperboreans and located the latter at the North Pole. According to several accounts, Hyperborea split into the islands of Thule and Ultimate Thule which some people identified with Iceland and Greenland. Soon the concept of Vril appeared. In 1871, British novelist Edward Bulwer-Lytton in The Coming Race book described a superior race, the Vrilia, who lived beneath the earth and planned to conquer the world with Vril, a psychokinetic energy. The French author Louis Jacoliet furthered the myth in his book The Sons of God in 1873 and his book The Indo-European Traditions in 1876. In these books, he linked Vril with the subterranean people of Thule. The Thuleans will harness the power of Vril to become supermen to rule the world. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche also emphasized the concept of the Superman and began his final work, The Antichrist, in 1895 with the line, quote, Let us see ourselves for what we are. We are Hyperboreans. We know well enough how we are living off that track, unquote. Nietzsche, a mystery school initiate, as this forthcoming quote will reveal, never mentioned Vril, yet in his posthumously uh, published collection of adages, The Will to Power, he emphasized the role of an internal force for superhuman development. He wrote that, quote, the herd, meaning common persons, the sheep, strive for security within itself through creating morality and rules, whereas the supermen have an internal vital force that drives them to go beyond the herd. That force necessitates and drives them to lie to the herd in order to remain independent and free from the, quote, herd mentality. Ironically, this describes how the mystery school agents maintain their control over the sheep, even referring to them as the, quote, unquote, herd. Thus, many Germans in the early 20th century believed that they were the descendants of the Aryans who had migrated south from Hyperbole Thule and who were destined to become the master race of supermen through the power of Vril. Hitler was among them. The Tool Society and the founding of the Nazi Party. Felix Niedner, the German translator of the Old Norse Edis, founded the Tool Society in 1910. In 1918, Rudolf von Sebendorf established its Munich branch. Sebatendorf had previously lived for several years in Istanbul, where in 1910 he had formed a secret society that combined esoteric Sufism and Freemasonry. 
They believed in the creed of the assassins, deriving from the Nazari sect of Ismaili Islam, which had flourished during the Crusades, and you have heard a lot about them if you follow this channel. And in fact, I contend that Barack Hussein Obama is an initiated assassin, or Hashashin. While in Istanbul, Sibatendorf was also undoubtedly familiar with the pan Turanian or Pan-Turkic movement of the Young Turks, started in 1908, which was largely behind the Armenian genocides of 1915 and 16. And not to be confused with the degenerate Young Turks today, of whom would probably be in favor of another Armenian genocide if they had their way. In 1919, the society spawned the German Workers' Party. Starting later that year, Dietrich Eckert, a member of the Inner Circle of the Thule Society, initiated Hitler into the society and began to train him in its methods for harnessing Vril to create a race of Aryan supermen. Hitler had been mystic-minded from his youth when he had studied the occult and theosophy in Vienna. Later, Hitler dedicated Mein Kampf to Eckert. And folks, if you haven't read that book, I suggest you do. In 1920, Hitler became the head of the German Workers' Party, now renamed the National Socialist German Worker Nazi Party. Haushofer, the Vril Society, and Geopolitics. Another major influence on Hitler's thinking was Karl Haushofer, a German military advisor to the Japanese after the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05. Because he was extremely impressed with Japanese culture, Many believe that he was responsible for the later German-Japanese alliance. He was also highly interested in Indian and Tibetan culture, learned Sanskrit, and claimed that he had visited Tibet. After serving as a general in the First World War, Haushofer founded the Vril Society in Berlin in 1918. It shared the same basic beliefs as the Thule Society, and some say that it was its inner circle. The society sought contact with supernatural beings beneath the earth to gain from them the powers of Vril. It also asserted a Central Asian origin of the Aryan race. And I'd like to point out here that based on a project that I am in the midst of completing, this theory may well be correct. From my research thus far on the beginning of human civilization, it seems as though the Aryan race may have indeed come out of the Central Asia, maybe from the Taurus Mountains which would have been one of the few places to have been safe from the deluge. I'm also very close to proving that these are the same people who have come to rule the world as we know it today. So this information is very interesting to me and connects a lot of dots. Haushofer developed the doctrine of geopolitics and in the early 1920s became the director of the Institute for Geopolitics at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Subsequently, Haushofer often visited the future Fuhrer, teaching him geopolitics in association with the ideas of the Thule and Vril societies. Thus, when Hitler became Chancellor in 1933, he adopted geopolitics as his policy for the Aryan race to conquer Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia. And another note on the Thule society, after exploring the Antarctic region, we find an old tribe residing in a village called Thule. Thule is named for Thule, an ancient Greek name dating to the 3rd century BC for a land believed to lie to the north of Britain, and the Latin phrase Ultima Thule, or Farthest Thule. The ancient Rome com Roman concept of a northernmost locale beyond the borders of the known world. World powers even created an airbase on this land called Thule Air Base in 1953, and in order to limit contact with soldiers, the Danish government relocated Old Thule with about 130 inhabitants to a newly constructed modern village 60 miles north known as New Thule. What info exactly did the Nazis have, folks? How did they know that these people inhabited that area? And on a side note, just early last year, 2019, a gravity anomaly below the ice of Antarctica was detected, leading to speculations that conspiracy theories about the secret Nazi base of World War II are true. Several post-war studies on Nazism and the occult, such as Trevor Rav uh, Ravenscroft's 
in the Spear of Destiny book from 1973 have asserted that under the influence of Haushofer and the Thule Society, Germany sent annual expeditions to Tibet from 1926 to 1943. Their mission was first defined and then to maintain contact with the Aryan forefathers in Shambhala and Agarti. Adepts there were the guardians of secret occult powers, especially Vril, and the mission sought their aid in harnessing those powers for creating an Aryan master race. According to these accounts, Shambhala refused any assistance, but Agarti agreed. Subsequently, from 1929, groups of Tibetans purportedly came to Germany and started lodges known as the Society of Green Men, in connection with the Green Dragon Society in Japan, through the intermediary of Haushofer. They supposedly helped the Nazi cause with their occult powers. Himmler was attracted to these groups of Tibetan Agarti adepts and, purportedly, from their influence established the Anurbi in 1935. It's hard to know if anything was definitively found as the Nazis employed a very sophisticated disinformation campaign. It's also hard to know what really happened to Hitler as it is supposedly the Russians who breached his bunker and things coming from the communist USSR at the time are sketchy. One theory is that Hitler was able to escape to South America and there is actually a decent series on the History Channel I believe that investigates these claims. However, there is another somewhat prevalent theory that Hitler was able to escape to Antarctica. The legend says that Hitler and many of his Nazi minions escaped Germany in the closing days of World War II and fled, the, fled to Antarctica where at the South Pole they had discovered an entrance to the Earth's interior. According to the Hollow Earth Research Society in Ontario, Canada, they are still there. After the war, the organization claims the Allies discovered that more than 2,000 scientists from Germany and Italy had vanished, along with almost a million people to the land beyond the South Pole. The story gets more complicated with Nazi design UFOs, Nazi collaboration with people who live in the center of the earth, and the explanation for Aryan looking UFO pilots. While the evidence for either hollow earth theory is close to nil, although some folks claim to have proof in the form of photos, the story involving Nazis, war, and the romance of exploratory adventure sounds like the makings of a great Indiana Jones story. And in fact it is. In the novel Indiana Jones in the Hollow Earth by Max McCoy, Indy comes into possession of a mysterious journal hitting, hinting at the existence of an underground civilization that he and the Nazis race to find. In the Chronicles of Chi, we are briefly introduced by J. E. Carey's explanation to the ancient man-made flying saucers originating in Nazi Germany. Mentioned before, the secret Vril Society, a small group of pre-Nazi German occultists under the umbrella of Nazi Germany, developed anti-gravity flying saucers and time-traveling technology during World War II. Most likely inspired by Tesla, they understood the combination of spirituality and technology in order to make contact to the unknown. These flying saucers, however, were then used to enter a black hole in Antarctica during the, uh, <laughs> this is going to be bad, the Neuschwabenland expedition in order to access inner earth and visit the mythical kingdom of Tibetan legends called Agartha. If you're patient enough to dig deeper into World War II history, you will find out that most Nazis, including Hitler, left Germany right before the end of World War II for South America where they built German villages and tested their flying saucers in plain sight, shooting out of caves in the ocean so that until this very day, seeing a UFO isn't anything strange to South Americans. On the contrary, UFOs are widely celebrated and in some cities, even used as a tourist magnet. An engineer named Joseph Andres Epps claimed he had been involved in the development of the technology during the wartime and that the Shriver Habermole project involved some 15 different prototypes. No doubt based on these findings, after the war, the U.S. with Medal of Honor recipient Admiral Byrd organized the research expedition to Antarctica in 1947. The public object objective to construct an American training and research facility in the South Pole. 
But the truth is, America and Russia were still looking for the Nazi base and wanted to confiscate technology using it for their own advantage in the slowly developing Cold War to gain world power. In 1946, Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal appointed Byrd as officer in charge of Antarctica Developments Project. And please take a moment to look up the circumstances surrounding Forrestal's untimely death. It seems to be a story straight from the movie Men in Black. It would be Byrd's fourth Antarctic expedition and was codenamed Operation High Jump. It was the largest Antarctic expedition to date and was expected to last six to eight months. The expedition was supported by a large naval force designated Task Force 68. There were 13 U.S. Navy support ships besides the flagship USS Mount Olympus and the, and the aircraft carrier USS Philippine Sea. Six helicopters, six flying boats, two seaplane tenders, and 15 other aircraft. The total number of personnel involved was over 4,000. The Armada arrived in the Ross Sea on December 31, 1946 and made aerial explorations of an area half the size of the United States, recording 10 new mountain ranges. The major area covered was the eastern coastline of Antarctica from 150 degrees east to the Greenwich Meridian. And this is about the extent of the official record of this event other than an establishment controlled description of some relatively dull scientific experiments. Author Raymond Bernard, who wrote The Hollow Earth in 1964, claims, among, with, along with many others, that Admiral Byrd had a secret diary, making several interesting comments concerning his flights to the North and South Poles, which indicate that he had indeed crossed over into the Earth's interior. Byrd referred to the land beyond the Poles as that enchanted continent in the sky, land of everlasting mystery. And here's an excerpt from Bird's alleged secret diary. Bird has some very interesting quotes that he is on record with stating after this expedition. Quote, There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny. But I must do duty and record here for all to read one day. In a world of greed and exploitation of mankind, can no longer suppress that which is true. Also in his diary, Bird has a flight log from February 19th, 1947. The following has not officially been verified. This is a transcript of a flight log that Bird transcribed into his diary. 9.10, vast ice and snow below, note coloration of yellowish nature, and disperse in a linear pattern, altering course foe a better examination of this color pattern below, note reddish or purple color also, circle this area two full turns and return to assigned compass heading, Pos position check made again to base camp and relay information concerning colorations in the ice and snow below. Another at 910. Both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there is no indication of icing. 10 a.m. We are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be new, no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 10.05 a.m. I alter attitude, altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. 
We make, we make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to a thousand feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Reporting this to base camp. 10.30 a.m. Encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. 11.30 a.m. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God, off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are dish-shaped and have radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 a.m. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or German accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral, you are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 11.40 a.m. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 11.45 a.m. I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. Now the following allegedly comes from Bird's memory. From this point, I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination and would seem all but madness if it had not happened. The radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We were then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us towards the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of a crystal material. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design board of a Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are given some type of warm beverage with taste, which tasted like nothing I have ever savored before. It is delicious. After about 10 minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters and announce that I am to accompany them. I have no choice but to comply. I leave my radio man behind and we walk a short distance and enter into what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments, the machine stops and the door lifts silently upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by a rose colored light that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. The door slides noiselessly open and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks. Have no fear, Admiral, you are to have an audience with the master. I step inside and my eyes adjust to the beautiful coloration that seems to be filling the room completely. Then I begin to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the most beautiful sight of my entire existence. It is in fact too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think there exists a human term that can describe it in any detail with justice. 
My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world? I half gasped under my breath. Yes, the master replies with a smile. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue. You see, we never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Your emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted, but what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. And boy, oh boy, dear listeners, ain't this the truth. Sound familiar? Continuing, I nodded and the master continued. In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugelrads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black flurry, fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your sciences. It may rage on until every flower of your, culture, of your culture is trampled, and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? No, I answer. It happened once before. The Dark Ages came and they lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son replied the master the dark ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall but i believe that some of your race will live through the storm beyond that i cannot say we see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race seeking it lost in legendary treasures and they will be here my son safe in our keeping when that time arrives we shall come forward again to help revive your culture and your race perhaps by then you have learned the futility of war and its strife and after that time Certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are the return of the surface world with this message. With these closing words, our meeting seemed at an end. I stood for a moment as in a dream, but yet I knew this was reality. And for some strange reason, I bowed slightly, either out of respect or humility. I do not know which. Suddenly, I was again aware that the two beautiful hosts who had brought me here were again at my side. This way, Admiral, motioned one. I turned once more before leaving and looked back towards the master. A gentle smile was etched on his delicate and ancient face. Farewell, my son, he spoke. Then he gestured with a lovely, slender hand, a motion of peace, and our meeting was truly ended. Quickly, we walked back through the great door of the master's chamber and once again entered into the elevator. The door slid slight, silently downward and we were at once going upward. One of my hosts spoke again. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable and you must return with this message to your race. I said nothing. All of this was almost beyond belief, and once again my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. 
I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, it's all right, Howie, it's all right. The two beings motioned us toward the awaiting conveyance. We boarded and soon arrived back at the aircraft. The engines were idling and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed charged now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside for some distance, guiding us on our return way. I must state here, the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. 2.15 a.m. A radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. We watched for a moment as the flying machines disappeared into the pale blue sky. The aircraft suddenly felt as though caught in a sharp downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We did not speak for some time. Each man had his own thoughts. Now from a March 11th, 1947 entry. I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for several hours, six hours and 39 minutes to be exact. I am interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of the United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders. Interestingly, in addition to this from Admiral Richard, Richard E. Byrd, here is the final entry into his alleged diary written on uh, December 30th, 1956. The last few years elapsed since 1947 have not been kind. I now make my final entry into this singular diary. In closing, I must state that I have faithfully kept this matter secret as directed all these years. It has been completely against my values of moral right. Now I, am, I seem to sense the long night coming on and this secret will not die with me, but as all truth shall, it will triumph and so it shall. This can be the only hope for mankind. I have seen the truth and it has quickened my spirit and has set my has set me free. I have done my duty towards the monstrous military industrial complex. Now the long night begins to approach, but there shall be no end. Just as the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of truth shall come again, and those who are of darkness shall fall in its light. For I have, I have seen that land beyond the pole, that center of the great unknown. Admiral Richard E. Byrd, United States Navy. Now, that was all entries from his supposed secret diary. However, here's an official on record statement made by the Admiral. Quote, Strangely enough, there is left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being, and that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Little America. In January 1956, Admiral Byrd led another expedition to the Antarctic. In this expedition, he and his crew penetrated for 2,300 miles into the center of the Earth again. Admiral Byrd states that the North and South Pole are actually two of many openings to the center of the Earth. I can't help but think about Jules Verne's famous science fiction book entitled Journey to the Center of the Earth, which many of you may have read or watched the movie version. Admiral Byrd also states inner Earth has an inner sun. Admiral Byrd's theory is that the poles of the Earth are convex rather than concave. Ships and planes can actually fly or drive right in. The American press announced Admiral Byrd's discovery, however, it was immediately suppressed by our good friends, the secret government. Another interesting fact is that the United States government does not let planes fly over the poles. All flights are directed to go around the poles, and any airline pilot flying in these areas will tell you this. Another interesting phenomenon is the fact that the icebergs are composed of fresh water and not salt water that drift from the poles. Another interesting question is why it is warmer nearer the poles than it is 600 to 1,000 miles away from it. 
In Dr. Raymond Bernard's book called The Hollow Earth, spoken about earlier, he tells of a man who confirmed Admiral Byrd's story. Dr. Nephi Cotton of Los Angeles reported that one of his patients, a man of Nordic descent, told him the following story during a counseling session. Quote, I lived near the Arctic Circle in Norway. One summer, my friends and I made up our minds to take a boat trip together and go as far as we could into the North Country. So we put a month's worth of food provisions in a small fishing boat and sent to sea. At the end of one month, we had traveled far into the North, beyond the Pole, and into a strange new country. We were much astonished at the weather there, warm, and at times at night it was almost too warm to sleep. Then we saw something so strange that we were both astonished. Ahead of the warm open sea, we were on what looked like a great mountain. Into that mountain, at a certain point, that ocean seemed to be emptying. Mystified, we continued in that direction and found ourselves sailing into a vast canyon leading into the interior of the earth. We kept sailing and then we saw what surprised us, a sun shining inside the earth. The ocean that had carried us into the hollow interior of the earth gradually became a river. This river led, as we came to realize later, all through the inner surface of the world from one end to the other. It can take you, if you follow it long enough, from the North Pole clear through to the South Pole. We saw that the inner surface of the Earth was divided, as the other one is, into both land and water. There is plenty of sunshine and both animal and veg vegetable life abounds there. We sailed further and further into this fantastic country, fantastic because everything was huge in size as compared with things on the outside. Plants are big, trees are gigantic, and finally we came to the giants. They were dwelling in homes and towns just as we do on the earth's surface, and they used a type of electrical conveyance like a monorail car to transport people. It ran along the river's edge from town to town. Several of the inner earth inhabitants, huge giants, detected our boat on the river and were quite amazed. They were, however, quite friendly. They were invited, we were invited to dine with them in their homes and so my companion and I separated, he going with one giant to that giant's home and I going with another giant to his home. My gigantic friend brought me home to his family and I was completely dismayed to see the huge size of all the objects in his home. The dinner table was colossal. A plate was put before me and filled with a portion of food so big it would have fed me abundantly an entire week. The giant offered me a cluster of grapes and each grape was as big as one of our peaches. I tasted one and found it far sweeter than any I had ever tasted outside. In the interior of the earth, all the fruits and vegetables taste far better and more flavorsome than those we have on the outer surface of the earth. We stayed with the giants for one year, enjoying their companionship as much as they enjoyed knowing us. We observed many strange and unusual things during our visit with these remarkable people, and were continually amazed at their scientific progress and inventions. All this time they were never unfriendly to us, and we were allowed to return to our own home in the same manner in which we came. In fact, they courteously offered their protection, if we should need it, for the return voyage. Dear listeners, do what you will with this information. If you enjoyed this presentation, please like, share, and sub subscribe, and please consider hitting the notification bell and supporting this channel on Patreon. The link is in the description. Thank you for watching.